We welcome you as you join us in cyberspace for this time of prayer, of meditation, of hearing the word of our God. I pray that God's peace and blessing will come upon you as you participate together in this recorded worship. Our call to worship today comes from this, as adapted from Psalm 62, verses 5 through 12. For God alone our souls wait in silence, for our hope is from Him. He alone is our rock and our salvation, our fortress, and we shall not be shaken. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Once God has spoken, twice we have heard this. The power belongs to God, and steadfast love to you, O Lord. Please join with me in our gathering prayer. Once God, excuse me, wrong spot. Let us pray. Merciful God, amidst the hustle and bustle of life, there are many thoughts, ideas, and activities that turn our focus from you. While most of us do not have idols of wood or stone, we struggle to put you first in our lives. Help us, mighty God, to focus our hope and our trust in you alone, and in that spirit of, of that trust to match our prayers with faithful actions. This we pray through Christ Jesus our Lord. going on here 
than we would think. A second time. A second time. This was the second time that the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jonah. And so if this was the second time, then what happened the first time? Now for those of us who are familiar with the story of Jonah, we know that the first time God called him to go to Nineveh, Jonah got into a boat and sailed in the opposite direction. And God, not willing to let a mere mortal win a contest of persistence with the Almighty, kicked up a storm and summoned a big fish to swallow his erstwhile prophet bowl. And so, brothers and sisters, I believe that when God called Jonah this second time, Jonah still reeked of fish guts as he was spewed up onto the beach. Knowing the rest of the story gives us a very different perspective on what's going on here. Taken in this context, the story of Jonah is a story of God's purposes being accomplished despite the best efforts of God's messenger to sabotage to the message. Unless we think that Jonah's sabotage was done when he washed the fish guts off of his clothes and proceeded to travel to Nineveh. Jonah kept at it. He didn't want to go in the first place, and when he finally went, well, let's just say that Jonah did not put his best effort into his ministry and mission. The Bible tells us that he walked a third of the way into the city and cried out, and I read between the lines in a rather half-hearted manner, he cried out, 40 more days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. As I read this passage, I've come to believe that Jonah did the bare minimum that he believed he needed to do to get God off his back. I went, and I uttered the words that you told me, Jonah could have said to God. What more do you want from me? Perhaps the biggest surprise in this prophetic book full of surprises is that the people of Nineveh heard this half-hearted sermon and repented in sackcloth and ashes. The great spiritual giants of the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Hosea, Micah, and so many more. They would have loved to have had a record like Jonah's. And yet, despite their best efforts, they were not heard. And here Jonah shows up and does the bare minimum. And the people repent. While these observations provide the basics of the story, much of God's message to us is found in the backstory, in the things that we need to know to understand exactly why Jonah behaved the way that he did. You see, brothers and sisters, Nineveh was not just any city. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, an ancient people known for both their strength and their ruthlessness. It was the Assyrians who approximately 50 years after Jonah's prophetic ministry would wipe Samaria off the map and scatter the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel, much like they had done to many other people even by the time of Jonah. During Jonah's prophetic ministry, Israel 
Assyria was the strongest of Israel's enemies. The one that had the kings of both Israel and Judah lying awake at night, wondering what to do about them. Far from running from God because Jonah did not understand God's character, Jonah ran from God precisely because he was afraid that his enemies might hear his message and repent. And knowing God the way that he did, Jonah strongly suspected that if they heard the word of the Lord and turned around, that God also would change his mind. In this way, Jonah was a far more gifted prophet than we give him credit for. Because his internal predictions turned out to be exactly what the Bible tells us happened. When God saw that the Ninevites had repented, God also repented from the calamity that he had prepared for them. This was exactly what Jonah was afraid would happen. Jonah was afraid that God would withhold the punishment that he and his people so desperately wanted to see the Assyrians receive. And so while on the surface the book of Jonah is a book about God triumphing over sabotage to bring about repentance, just below the surface, it is a book about the lack of repentance from God's erstwhile prophet. As if we go into chapter 4, we find that the book of Jonah does not have a happy ending. Jonah himself never gets it. The book ends with Jonah pouting because the Assyrians repented, God relented from punishing him, and God didn't have the, the mercy to let Jonah die in his wallowing self-pity. And so as we look at the book of Jonah as a whole, I believe our most pressing question is to ask ourselves, is there any individual or group of people that we would have a similar reaction to God forgiving. Not so much is there anyone that we would be shocked that they actually repented. But is there anyone whom we, like Jonah, would protest that their repentance was not enough? Their change of behavior was not enough. Like many biblical stories, the book of Jonah turns our expectations on their heads. The hated Assyrians who do not know God repent, following the most half-baked sermon in the history of preaching. God's prophet, the one who is supposed to be a holy man, ends the story pouting like a small child who does not get his way. The Israelites, the ones who are supposed to be God's people, the, the nation that God chose out of all of the other nations to have a relationship with and to follow his commandments, did not repent even when spiritual giants like Isaiah and Micah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Amos and Hosea were sent to them. Everything about this story is inside out and upside down. I believe that perhaps the most important thing for us to take with us from this meditation is the question of which of our expectations Expectations regarding God, expectations regarding others, or expectations regarding ourselves do we need to leave behind so that we might fully embrace God and God's ways? Jonah, even after everything that he had been through, could not, or maybe more accurately would not, leave his prejudice, his anger, his sense of indignity behind. I pray that we would open ourselves to being surprised by God, trusting that repentance and forgiveness are open to everyone, 
both our enemies and ourselves. Amen.